we uh, now uh, move on to the uh, second half of the course and uh, having completed our discussion of uh, first law of uh, thermodynamics both for a system as well as a control volume, we are now uh, ready to uh, discuss second law of thermodynamics. Okay. But as I mentioned during the introduction, one of the most important things that we should uh, do first is motivate the need for a second law. In other words, what was deficient in the uh, analysis that we have done so far using first law? What, uh, what aspects have been absent and how do we account for that? So, that provides the motivation for second law. Okay. And we uh, already noted this point that heat supplied during a cyclic process cannot be entirely converted into work. Um, we saw that when you supply heat to a system, we are actually supplying uh, energy to the internal energy of the working substance which is a disordered mode. And when we supply energy to a disordered mode and try to run a, a cyclic process, then all of the heat cannot be converted to work. If it is run as a single process, then we can convert all of the heat into work. But if you want to run it as a cyclic process, <coughs> we saw that because we are supplying uh, heat uh, to the disordered uh, energy mode of the system, it cannot all be converted to work. Now, the uh, question that naturally arose in the uh, minds of earlier, uh, I mean engineers who were dealing with this uh, during the earlier times was, is it possible to continuously improve our device to a level where it is like an ideal device and would it then be possible to convert all of the heat into work? And our discussion here makes it clear that it has nothing to do with the, uh, with the actual state of the device. Because whenever we supply heat to a system, we can always supply only to the internal energy or disordered mode. That has nothing to do with whether the device is in a good running condition or not, right. The, if the device is not in a good running condition, that will only ma make matters worse. But that is not the fundamental reason why we are not able to convert all of the heat into work, okay. So, the, this realization uh, came to engineers who were uh, looking at this um, in the beginning. And uh, so, they saw that even if you uh, make the device ideal, it was clear that not all of the heat can be converted to work. So, there seemed to be a fundamental limitation in how much of the work, how much of the heat can be converted to work. Now, the next question, logical question that arises then is, okay, if we have an ideal device, how much of the, uh, the heat will that device be able to convert to work, okay. So, then the, uh, the corresponding amount for the actual device will be even less, okay. Uh, so, that was the question that naturally arose uh, when engineers were looking at this. And so, these are questions that we will answer when we uh, discuss second law of thermodynamics. So, that is one very important aspect that second law of thermodynamics addresses. So, what is the maximum performance possible which would be that of a, an ideal device and then we can actually calculate the performance of um, real life devices, ok. The second uh, important question that second law uh, would address is the directionality of spontaneous processes. There are many processes in nature which are spontaneous. For example, heat always flows from higher temperature to lower temperature and air at high pressure stored in a vessel preferentially escapes from the vessel into the ambient. The reverse processes do not take place spontaneously. We have to do something to make them happen. Although from an energy perspective, uh, probably both uh, are equally possible. There is no um, uh, preferential direction in uh, first law. In fact, if you look at first law, uh, even for the first bulletin item that we talked about, okay, heat supplied during a cyclic process, uh, how much of it can be converted. So, if you look at first law for a cyclic process, you may recall that the first law reads like this. So, there is nothing in this uh, statement that uh, precludes all of the heat from being converted to work. <coughs> so, as long as the energy balance is correct, first law <coughs> does not preclude all of the heat from being converted to work. Okay. Similarly, uh, first law does not really have uh, a way of uh, telling the, the directionality of processes, in which direction is the process most likely to occur, okay. Because it has only energy balance and nothing more than that. So, that is a limitation that first law has, whereas second law 
<coughs> would be able to tell which in which direction proce uh, process will take place and um, uh, that determines whether the process is spontaneous or not. Okay. So, these are aspects that we will look at as we uh, go through this discussion. Okay. So, the first question that we are going to uh, try to answer using second law is this. For engines that operate in a cycle and convert heat to work, what is the highest allowed efficiency? In other words, I have an ideal engine and what is the efficiency for such an engine ok. Of course, we will formally define uh, efficiency and we are going to formally define a heat engine next ok. These things need to be formalized so that there is no ambiguity or gaps in our understanding as we look at much more complicated devices ok. So, a heat engine is, uh, uh, is a continuously operating, please replace this with is. So, a heat engine is a continuously operating thermodynamic system which has heat and work interactions with the surroundings. Okay. Continuously operating uh, would refer to a cyclic process because any other process would be a discrete process. It will happen and then it will stop. Continuously operating implies that uh, the device operates forever which is which would not be possible if it were not operating in a cyclical manner. Okay. So, unless it operates in a cyclical manner, no operation can be continuous and forever. Okay. So, it op so a heat engine uh, is a continuously operating thermodynamic system. Notice that here also we are saying it is a thermodynamic system, okay. which means no mass can come in or go out into the system okay. and it has heat and work interactions with the surroundings. Let us look at a couple of examples of uh, heat engines and then try to understand this definition better. The first one that we will look at is the so called uh, uh, Rankine cycle which is a direct heat engine. We have already uh, mentioned this earlier. A direct heat engine is one which is uh, power producing. So, the net power uh, from such an engine is positive. Okay. Um, this is the simplest form of the Rankine cycle and this is what is typically used in coal fired thermal power plants. Okay. So, basically uh, heat is added in a boiler. So, water is the working substance here and water uh, goes through this cyclic processes. It circulates in this loop that is shown like this. So, uh, so it goes through these states as it goes through this loop. Notice that the loop is fully closed. So, the water that uh, executes these processes in this loop is the thermodynamic system that we are looking at. So, we add heat to the water in the boiler, its temperature is increased, then goes to the turbine and executes the process. So, let us start with state 1. So, at state 1, the water is actually uh, in a superheated state, superheated steam. So, it is actually superheated steam. It then expands to the through the turbine and it comes out as a typically as a saturated mixture at a low pressure and a low temperature. It then enters the condenser where it uh, rejects heat to the ambient and exits the condenser as a saturated liquid at low pressure and low temperature ok. There is no, uh, we neglect any pressure law, uh, pressure drop in the uh, condenser. So, it leaves the condenser as a saturated liquid at the same temperature and the same pressure ok. So, this is then pumped in the pump to uh, high pressure compressed liquid. So, this uh, compressed liquid is then taken to the boiler where heat is added and as a result <coughs> it comes out as superheated steam and the process is repeated uh, again and again. So, this uh, can be uh, a continuously running uh, device and the system that we are looking at is this loop which encloses the water. So, this qualifies as a direct heat engine. In fact, if you look at uh, whatever is inside the red box, okay. So this is the, uh, so this is a system, continuously operating thermodynamic system, which has heat and work interactions with the surroundings. So these are heat interactions, these are work interactions. So whatever is inside, it's a continuously operating thermodynamic system, and because the net power uh, is positive, we call this a direct heat engine. 
ok. The second example of a heat engine that we will look at is a gas turbine engine and that operates in the so called Brayton cycle. Here air is the working substance and air uh, actually executes a cyclic process in this loop. So, air is contained in this loop and it uh, flows through like this. So, air is the working substance and uh, let us see uh, what happens here. So, typically at state 1, uh, the air is at uh, maybe uh, ambient pressure, not necessary, but it is at ambient pressure and ambient temperature. The air is then compressed in a compressor and comes out at high pressure and higher temperature, not necessarily high temperature, but higher temperature. So, we then take the air to the combustor where heat is added to the air uh, typically by burning a fuel um, which is uh, which can be a liquid fuel or natural gas or it is not coal, but it can be any other fuel. So, uh, typically heat is added to the air here and when it comes out, it comes out at the same uh, pressure which is high and it also comes out at a high temperature. So, now it is at high pressure and high temperature. So, it then expands in the turbine produces work. A part of the power that is produced by the turbine is utilized to run the compressor as you can see from this arrangement. And so, the net power that comes out is actually positive which is why this is also uh, categorized as a direct heat engine. So, after expansion in the um, uh, in the turbine, it comes out at uh, a low pressure and a lower temperature. It is then taken to the cooler which is nothing but a heat exchanger where it is cooled down to ambient pressure which is the low pressure that we are talking about. So, ambient pressure and ambient temperature and the cycle is repeated. So, the thermodynamic system is the loop which encloses the air here and you can see that this operates continuously. So, in fact, uh, if I look at uh, whatever is inside the red box, that is a thermodynamic system which is continuously operating and in this case, uh, since the net power is positive, it is a direct heat engine. So, this is a thermodynamic system that we are talking about. What is that? Uh, this system operates continuously and it has heat and work interaction with the surroundings. The next example that we will see is a reverse heat engine ok. So, this is the cycle uh, that a refrigerant in a domestic refrigerator or air conditioner executes ok. Here we supply power to the uh, cycle so that it is a reverse heat engine that is why it is called a reverse heat engine. Let us see what happens here. So, here a uh, refrigerant uh, typically something like R134A although that is banned today, we can since uh, those are the tables that we are using, we will assume it to be R134A. So, today much better environmentally friendly refrigerants are used in domestic refrigerators. So, typically a refrigerant, so let us, uh, let us be politically correct and uh, say that the working substance is a refrigerant. So, the refrigerant executes a cyclic process 1, 2, 3, 4 and the loop that contains the refrigerant is a thermodynamic system that we are looking at. So, you can see here that at the end of the evaporator, so the refrigerant uh, is uh, typically a saturated vapor at a low temperature, low pressure and this is compressed in the compressor here. Uh, to a superheated state, high pressure, high temperature. Now, when I say high temperature, that is relative to the uh, the refrigerator temperature. Typically, uh, the evaporator in a refrigerator may be at a temperature of uh, 3 degrees Celsius or 4 degrees Celsius. So, this temperature here at the end of the compression would be more like 70, 80 degrees Celsius or so depending on the size of the refrigerator. So, it is then taken to a condenser where it loses heat to the ambient. So, when it comes out, it actually comes out as a saturated liquid typically at the same pressure which is the higher pressure that we high pressure that we talked about. There is no pressure loss in the in the condenser. So, it comes out at high pressure and at the same temperature, but as a saturated liquid. I am sorry, at a uh, I am sorry, at a lower temperature lower temperature
as a saturated liquid. So, it is then taken to a throttling valve. We, uh, uh, we looked at uh, the uh, fundamental uh, working principle of a throttling uh, valve before. So, basically we accomplish a change of state without any uh, change in enthalpy or kinetic energy and potential energy changes. So, basically we go from a, a high pressure, higher temperature state to a uh, low pressure, lower temperature state. So, when it comes out, it is at uh, low pressure and low temperature and typically it is a saturated mixture. So, this low pressure, uh, low temperature saturated mixture then enters the refrigerated compartment which is also called the evaporator. So, whatever is kept, in, uh, kept inside may be at uh, let us say uh, room temperature, let us say we have taken a bottle of water uh, or a bottle of juice or something else and kept it inside the refrigerator. So, that will be at a high temperature and so this low pressure, low temperature refrigerant then picks up the heat from the refrigerator compartment and then uh, the cyclic process is repeated. Okay. So, the thermodynamic system is the, uh, is the loop which uh, contains the refrigerant and as you can see here it executes a cyclic process 1, 2, 3, 4. In fact, whatever is inside the red box is our system which is continuously operating and which has heat and work interaction with the surroundings. Since uh, we are supplying power to this, this is a reverse heat engine. So, the three examples that we looked at, two uh, belonging to the direct heat engine category and one, this one belonging to the reverse heat engine category, all <coughs> are legitimate heat engines. And the important uh, aspect of a heat engine is that it must be continuously operating and it must be a thermodynamic system. There will be heat and work interactions of this system with the surroundings. So, what we can actually do is for the purpose of uh, a second law analysis, whatever is inside this uh, red boxes that we have identified, whatever is inside is actually immaterial. All we are, once we establish that it is a heat engine, the details inside of how actually uh, or what actually happens is immaterial. We look at it as a system. So, we take one cycle. So, remember here it is operating continuously. So, we have said Q h dot which is in units of watts as you know or W x dot uh, in or W x dot out which is also power in units of watts. Okay? So, we, uh, we look at one cycle that this system executes which means we will no longer have power or mass flow rate, we will only have work in joules. And we say that during one cycle or during each cycle, so much heat is supplied, so much heat is rejected, so much work uh, comes out of the cycle and so much work is put inside the cycle. That is what we will say. Okay? So, here also so much heat is supplied during a cycle, so much it is rejected during a cycle, so much work uh, is generated during the cycle, one cycle. Similarly, here during one cycle, so much heat is absorbed in the cycle, so much heat is rejected, so much uh, work is supplied to the cycle for a reverse engine. So, we will ignore all the inner details, that is, these are not uh, pertinent for uh, our analysis. You may actually look at the inner details in, uh, in, a, in a course like applied thermodynamics perhaps or uh, most certainly in a, in a course on uh, refrigeration and air conditioning and for these things you will look at the inner details in a course on power plant engineering for instance, but not for a uh, higher level thermodynamics course. Okay? So, as you can see here, this is the heat engine. So, we have encapsulated what was in the red uh, box inside this. Okay? Inside this we could have a, <coughs> we could have water uh, executing an Ankin cycle or air executing a Brayton cycle, the details are immaterial. So, this is a heat engine which is a continuously operating thermodynamic system okay? and it has the following heat interactions and work interaction with the surroundings. So, here this is a, let us uh, call this, this is a direct heat engine and this is a reverse heat engine. Again, it is a thermodyn continuously operating thermodynamic system with heat and work interaction. So, this is what was inside the red box in the case of a vapor compression cycle. Okay? So, so, we supply work and a certain amount of heat 
is removed from a low temperature uh, refrigerator space and rejected to the ambient typically. Okay, so this is all we uh, we need to know. So we have encapsulated what was in the red box in each one of this circle for a direct engine and for a reverse engine. Now let us try to define performance metrics for these two engines. Okay, so for a direct engine, the performance metric is efficiency. So this is efficiency and efficiency is defined as effect sought divided by effort input ok. So, here what we want is uh, work from the direct engine and we are supplying heat to the engine by burning uh, fuel a uh, fuel we are supplying heat to the engine ok. So, we may uh, write this as W net. We may also be supplying work in some parts of the cycle. So, the net work is what we are actually uh, looking for that is the effect that is sought ok. So, net work divided by heat that is supplied that is the efficiency of the engine. Now, if the device operates in a cyclic uh, process as we say a direct heat engine operates in a cyclic process. So, if you apply first law to this engine notice that the net heat is q h minus q c that should be equal to the net work that comes out w. Same is applicable here also ok. So, so w net divided by q h is this and I can uh, replace w net in case it is a cyclic process w net equal to q h minus q c and we can then write it like this ok. So, w uh, net equal to q h minus q c only for a cyclic process very very important. If it is a heat engine then it has to execute a cyclic process and the efficiency for the heat engine is like this. So, by definition eta lies between 0 and 1. Okay. So, the question that we asked at the beginning of this module, what is the maximum possible efficiency for a heat engine which uh, takes heat and converts it to work? So, what we are trying to ascertain is what is eta max? If the engine were ideal, what would be its efficiency? Now, in the case of a reverse engine, uh, two different performance metrics may be defined. Okay. Uh, the example that we have been seeing is that of a domestic refrigerator. In this case, what we want is for every uh, watt of electricity that we supply, we want to remove as much heat from the refrigerator compartment as possible. In other words, we want to maintain uh, low temperature in the refrigerator by spending as little power as possible. Okay, that is what we ideally want, right. So, that is so we want to maximize q c dot. So, the uh, effect sought is q c dot in this case. Now, in uh, colder countries, uh, the uh, reverse uh, uh, heat engine is also used for a different purpose. So, this actually uh, is a refrigerator or air conditioner, okay. We can also have something called a heat pump. Okay, so let us look at this. Okay, so if it uh, if this reverse if this reverse heat engine operates as a uh, refrigerator, then the effect sought is Q C. We want to maximize Q C for a given W. Now, as I said, in colder countries, a uh, heat pump is used during winter times. In the case of a heat pump, what is done is it takes heat from the cold ambient and then puts it inside a dwelling which is maintained at a comfortable temperature. So, this would be the dwelling or house which we want to maintain let us say at 30 degree Celsius ok. So, this could be the ambient at uh, say minus 10 degree Celsius. So, heat pump takes in power moves heat from the ambient which is at a low temperature and puts the heat in a dwelling which is maintained at a comfortable temperature ok. So, here what we want to maximize is q h. We want to spend as little power as possible in trying to maintain the dwelling at a comfortable temperature which means q h is the effect that is sought. 
So, in the case of a refrigerator, Q c is the effect that is sought and in the case of a heat pump, Q h is the effect that is being sought. So, accordingly, we have two different uh, performance metrics, one for the refrigerator, one for the heat pump. So, for the refrigerator, since the effect sought is Q c, we may write it like this and if it is a heat engine, which means it executes a cyclic process, once again uh, W may be written as Q h minus Q c. Okay, here we uh, we have uh, written it by um, uh, taking into account the fact that QH is uh, uh, negative, and uh, in fact, the way we have written this, I'm sorry, the way we have written this is we have not uh, used the sign convention. What we are saying here is uh, QC is being supplied, so QC is positive, QH is being rejected, so QH is negative, right? and W is actually being supplied. So, W is negative, uh, but by looking at this device, we can easily say uh, that, that W in this case also will be equal to uh, QH minus QC. If I look at it in terms of numbers, this typically would have been a negative number this would have been a positive number, this would have been a negative number, which means that this sign would have become plus. So, if I uh, multiply both sides by minus 1, then I get W, which is now a positive number and uh, you know, so this sign would have become positive and this again becomes negative, that is what we have done. So, so all the quantities that are going in here are positive numbers, okay. The sign has been taken into account when we write it like this. Okay. So, all these quantities are positive numbers. In the case of heat pump, the effect sought is actually Q h. So, we can actually write for a reverse heat engine, we can actually write uh, COP like this and COP, notice that COP varies between 0 and infinity. So, this part of the definition is applicable only if it is a reverse heat engine. And again, only true only for a reverse heat engine. Since by definition, a heat engine executes a cyclic process. Uh, what we will do in the next class is look at two uh, statements of uh, second law of thermodynamics, which actually tell you what the maximum efficiency cannot be. And this does not say what the maximum efficiency can be, it actually says what the maximum efficiency cannot be. So, that gives us an idea of what the upper bound is not. Okay. So, then we know that the actual value has to be something less than this and then we will uh, see what that value is. Okay. We will take this up in the next lecture.